All right, welcome to episode five of the Original Transplants podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm Will. I'm and Luke. all right, yeah. we have a guest uh, guest host this week. Say your name again. I'm Luke. Awesome. Thanks for joining us, Luke. Um, Luke's my brother, my younger brother, and he's hanging out with us on the homestead for a little bit this week. So we're going to be interviewing him as part of this week's podcast. Um, before we get too deep into the agenda, we want to remind you, you can find out more about Satayama Homestead by visiting our website, satayamahs.org. You'll also find a transcript of this episode, episode 5, at our Tumblr site, which is spreadcast.tumblr.com. And within a couple of days, we'll update the podcast episode with a transcript and references and show notes. And you're probably listening to the audio through our SoundCloud account. Look for Satayama Homestead and the original Transplants podcast set. Without further ado, we'll give you some of our Homestead updates for the week. So, Will, you did a beehive inspection today. Would you like to give us an apiary update? I did. Um, Luke, you were there. You saw yep. You saw me inspect. Um, we put on the veil, put on the gloves, and went out there to check it out. So um, when I popped open the first one, everybody was in good shape. Um, pretty friendly, you know, you guys were standing right there. I mean, yeah. you guys were right next to me as I was doing the, pulling the beehives apart, right? Yeah. They seemed mad after a while though. After a while? Yeah. How did you know they were mad? The buzzing got a lot louder and more aggressive. Yeah. Okay. So you heard that too. Yeah. yeah. You can kind of tell if you're in there for too long, they start to get angry. So, um... But I was in there long enough to see that they had lots of open brood. They had larva in there. Did you see the larva? Yeah. The worms. What they do is they actually, well, the eggs sit in there. Once the eggs hatch, the larva come out, and then they actually slime them with sugar. So, like, if you notice, they look slimy. They have just sugar, water, and, like, all this yummy stuff that they eat soaked around them. So... That's why they look that way. So I took some of those out so that I could put them in the the other hive. And then I opened up the other hive and um, they had, they're trying to raise a new queen. And you could see that because they have something called the super seizure cell, which means that they have tried in an emergency to raise a new queen. So if a queen dies in the hive, I see the look on Luke's face. Yeah, did that so, die? Yeah, that die? I, think, I think so. So either that or they didn't like the queen that they had. So if a, a queen dies... Off with her head. <laughs> basically, I think that's exactly yeah. what supersedure means, is, is putting in your own ruler, um, right? Like, if you're ruled by a certain person and you do a supersedure, you kick them out. So what, what they do is they t can take any egg that they have, any larva that they have, and then they can change it into a queen instead of a worker. All they do is they feed it a special diet. Mm. So once they feed it royal jelly which is a special type of sugary solution, then they get um, they get a queen out of it. But they have to make a different cell for the queen. So what they do is they create the cell. You saw the comb is flat all the way across. They create a cell that kind of hangs off mm -hmm. a little bit, and that'll be where the queen is raised. So so I'm actually pretty happy about it because they I know that they have a queen. Um, Oh yeah, and then the, once the queen's born, they go the one queen that the first one out of its cell goes around and kills all the other queen cells. So they'll build a couple queen cells and then raise a new one. So they were all broken open, which tells me that they are um, they have a queen in there now. She needs to go out on a mating flight at some point, which I you know I have no idea when that's going to be, and that can be dangerous because she's going out in the wide world. But once she comes back, she'll be loaded up with eggs ready to go and she can lay thousands of eggs a day so more honey. so yeah more honey exactly and yeah. how soon do you think um you might see signs of an actively laying queen um so after they're born probably another two weeks she needs another week for her wings to dry out and like get acclimated to the uh the hive and then another week to get her mating flight done and then she'll probably be ready to go Awesome. So probably not next inspection necessarily, but by the inspection after that. Yeah, sometime in August I expect to see something. And I mean, if they don't, I'm going to continue to transfer eggs from the good hive over to the bad hive. Um, the hive with the, the queen that's messed up, just in case. So if they need a new one, then they can 
get a new one. And for the past few weeks, you've been observing behavioral differences between the two hives, and we m might have made an observation this week that explains mm. some of those differences. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, Sarah took some pictures. And, um, and some moving pictures and, and some, video. some video. And if you look at the hives, one of them is in the sunlight in the morning, and the other one doesn't get as much sunlight, and they don't wake up as quickly. So we'll put some video and, and pictures up. Of that. So what we thought was hive weakness may just be a factor of how much sunlight they're getting, determining how active they are, how much foraging they're doing, yeah, how early in the day they get to start foraging, etc. But I'm definitely noticing that they're they're ramping up everything. They're collecting more pollen. They're collecting more nectar. I think they're getting ready for uh, for the winter. So I think we're out of the dearth for the most part. We saw some goldenrod today. Yeah. We saw. We saw some flowering trees when we were walking around um, Allentown mm -hmm. yesterday. So, yeah, there's, there's definitely some stuff going on. So, um, let's see. Yeah, no no pests. I was worried about pests. I was worried about hive beetles, which is these little beetles that came from the Middle East. And um, they'll invade your hive and they'll ruin everything. I was looking for those all over the place. I did not see. I saw one last week. I don't see any this week. So my bees are doing pretty well. Awesome. And Luke got to have some comb honey, right? That was so good. Yeah? What was it like? It was different than store-bought comb because the honey here, it's like actual honey. Like, there's probably not a lot of preserved, preserved, preserved. I can't talk today. Preserved? Yeah, <laughs> preserved it is because I can't talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, um, like it's just straight from the, um, comb. Yeah. yeah. yeah In fact, Will pulled out a frame that had some capped honey on it, and he just kind of scratched back the cap, oh, and yeah. Luke, you dipped your finger right in yeah, there, it was, right? it was thinner than regular honey. It is. It's yeah. a little waterier, for sure. Yeah, I don't know. I'm a little bit worried about that sometimes, because if, it, if it's got too much water in it, it can turn into alcohol. Can ferment, yeah, yeah, which is fermentation. So that which can... is fine when you're making mead, but not great when you're just trying to store honey. No, and it'll start to stink really bad and, and everything like that. So, well, I think that's pretty much it for the bees. I don't know. I'm pleased. Uh, you sometimes you inspect the bees and you come out of there and you're like, oh man, everything's in trouble. Or and sometimes you get out and you're like, this is great. Everything's on schedule. So I think we're good. Yeah. Great. Thanks for the apiary update. Sure. In terms of the poultry culture update, again, sort of a quiet week. Um, the biggest issue we're dealing with this past week is the heat and making sure that the chickens are staying cool enough. Uh, we did see a little bit of panting, especially yesterday, because as Will said, we were off the homestead for a bit, and so we had to keep them cooped and, and pretty closed up at a time of day when we would normally either let them free range around the yard or be able to be down in their enclosed run um, where they can get some shade and a nice breeze. So we definitely have been seeing some panting and keeping an eye on that, providing, you know, extra refrigerated produce for them to nibble on and extra bits of water wherever they happen to be hanging out in the yard. Um, I always, you know, look for any kinds of indicators of, um, health issues with them or behavioral issues with them yeah. so far so good except today we were um watching them do some cool stuff that i'll let luke talk about in a minute and we did notice that um sassafras our speckled sussex seemed to be kind of blinking her yeah. right eye a little bit it was a little bit winked closed um so we'll be keeping an eye on that but you know they're flinging dust all over the place they're getting their head <laughs> down into the weeds going after bugs they kind of um will play fight with each other so it could have been any small thing that is um bothering her eye um and this happened weeks ago with mm -hmm. uh henbit our rhode island red it was a day or two where her one eye looked a little bit puffy and a little bit squinty and then it just cleared up on its own which is what i like to see you know i don't obviously want them to suffer or be uncomfortable or get sick yeah. but i try to let nature take its course unless it's clear that something's getting really out of hand and only then would i intervene with with medicine or anything else <laughs> So in terms of chicken behavior, Luke, you got to see a couple of fun things today. Do you want to talk about what they were up to under the burning bush? Yeah, sure. They looked like they were dust bathing. I think that's what happened to her eye. I think she got some dust in it. Yeah. yeah. It didn't really look like she was bothering. It was bothering her because she just kept throwing dust up in the air. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Mayapple and what was 
maple and sassafras, sassafras, sassafras. looked yeah. like they had their own hole. Yeah. And, and henbit and um, dandelion had to had to make their own hole. They had to fend for yeah, themselves. Yeah. yeah. So what were you feeding them today that they seemed to enjoy? The oh, I forget what berries they were. Oh, sorry. Raspberries. Raspberries. Yeah. Exactly. Raspberries. They, like they love really raspberries. And then um, after their dust bath, do you remember what they did after that? Sunbathed and shook out the dust. Exactly, yeah. It's like after a big cloud of dust when Sassafras shook it out. Yeah. yeah. After a nice dust bath, they like to go lay out in the sun, expose their bellies, you know, their little... <laughs> just like people. Uh, feathery bellies, exactly, just, just like, like people. people. Yeah. And then they stand up Just like up and Benjamin leave. Franklin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Possibly apocryphal, but yeah. Um, yeah, and then they stand up and they shake out all the dust and all, you know, the little mites and bugs that were bothering them or the dander or whatever. So, all in all, I would say that the chickens are looking good. Again, their um, weight gain has slowed a lot, but even Luke was commenting that um, their chicken breasts, if you'll excuse the terminology, <laughs> were looking uh, pretty nice and full. Um, so, you know, hopefully they'll lay eggs for us, but if they don't lay eggs, there's always a backup plan. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the update out of the coop today. We'll give a, a brief edible landscape update, and then we'll get into our chores. Food. Exactly. Food. Food. Quite key here on the homestead. So if you've been following the podcast or the Tumblr site, you know that our summer veg is ripening up and we're harvesting a lot of tomatoes, a lot of summer squash, including our sunburst patty pan yellow squash, which I just love. Um, this is different from like a long neck yellow yeah. summer squash where it almost looks like, well, as the name suggests, a little sunburst. It's shaped like a little sun. So if you're looking for an interesting variety of summer squash to grow, if you're kind of over the whole zucchini thing, look for a patty pan squash. And in particular, I think the sunburst variety, I was reading in my Ed Smith's Vegetable um, Gardener's Bible book, that they're a prolific and pest and disease resistant variety, and I would definitely echo that sentiment. In fact, I believe the plants yeah, we, we have growing this year, yeah. yeah, and I believe the plants we have growing this year are from seeds that we saved. At least one of them is. Okay. So they're an easy variety to save seeds from as well. So that's all coming in. We've also seen our husk tomatoes, our ground cherry, start to come in. The cultivated variety that we planted has started to drop its husk tomatoes. And the interesting thing about husk tomatoes is they'll drop off the plant, the, the fruit in the husk, the little papery husk itself, will drop off the plant a little bit prior to really being ripe. So you want to keep them in that papery husk. Um, just on the counter or at room temperature for a couple days until the color of the fruit inside changes from a greenish yellow to more of a peachy, mango-y, orangey yellow color. And that's how you know that they're ripe and, mm. and good to eat. We're also, this is our first year growing huckleberries, and we're keeping an eye on those plants because we're starting to see some of the huckleberries change over to like a dark purple color. So I need to do some more investigation yeah, as I to don't... when you yeah. harvest those. All the books that we, we have in our library, like, they almost they t associate them with blueberries. Yeah, which is strange so because understand. to me they look like they belong to the nightshade family. Yeah, I don't get it. So we'll be looking, keeping an eye out for our huckleberries ripening. Um, right now we're basically between raspberry crops. We were able to pull a couple off of the canes today, fed some to the chickens, and then actually made some uh, black raspberry tea with another handful. Oh, so good. But um, yeah, yeah like Luke that. was enjoying that. <laughs> But really, we're seeing the next crop come in. Um, it's very heavy with pollinator activity, so we're happy about that. And we're sort of hanging tight and living off of the wild blackberries in the meantime. And later on this week, Luke, you and I, we'd be jamming. We've got... Literally. Literally, yeah. Frozen strawberries from very early in the season, late May, yeah. early June. Go pick got, some. Yep. Frozen wine berries from uh, mid-June. Frozen raspberries from the first crop and frozen blackberries from what we've got coming in now. So we'll be um, preserving and canning those as jam, which will be great. I believe that's everything I wanted to mention from the edible landscape. Anybody notice anything else as we were running around today? Mm. Well, actually, Luke, you mentioned that you had something coming in in your edible landscape at home. The peppers? Exactly. Yeah. You want to talk about your peppers at all? Yeah, they're actually starting to turn red. What kind are they? Cayenne. Cayenne, my, that's right. You said cayenne. My yeah. parents are growing um, jalapenos. Cool. Mm. They're confused of when they're supposed to pick them because they said, like, the tips should start to turn red, and that's when you should pick them. Oh, yeah. But jalapeno, regular jalapenos are green, 
so they don't know they're gonna pick them off and then keep one on until it turns fully red yeah and see which one tastes better but yeah hopefully once I get I have four cayenne plants and once I get them all I'm gonna make a hot sauce awesome I'll give you guys some hopefully sweet yeah cool do you good. like hot sauce uh, I love hot sauce yeah yeah is that your thing yeah, and you were just commenting when we were upstairs that we still have a string of dried cayenne peppers that we grew yeah. and dried yeah. like a couple of years ago, and I'll still use them in recipes, and they're fine. You know, just keep the dust off them. So. You have to keep the dust off because it'll get in your eyes and your nose, and it's terrible. Oh, you're talking about the pepper dust. Yeah. I was referring to the ambient dust that settles on the peppers. Every oh, time. I gotcha, yeah. But sure. that's true. Be very careful if you're going to blend peppers, uh, crushed peppers, or yeah. mortar, oh, mortar and pestle them. Um, because I was doing that with some of our, I believe those were the Bolivian rainbow hot peppers that we grew last year. Yeah. And I was trying to make red pepper flakes with them and it did get in my eyes, in my nasal passages, in my throat. <laughs> it was brutal. So <laughs> yeah. wear PPE, personal protective equipment for handling hot peppers. Yeah. Gloves yeah. at the least. Yeah. And I'll say we're growing jalapenos as well. I never heard the thing about picking them when the tips turned red. I've just been picking them when well, they're. I think my mom and dad read that somewhere, I think. Yeah. I don't know. That's cool. I'll keep it in mind. I pick them when they're like two to three inches long usually. And um, they're very easy, both the cayenne and the jalapenos, to save seeds from. So you guys can think about that when you're using them in recipes or if you dry them and you take the seeds out, you can save those for next year and plant them. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, other things around the homestead. Um, you saw a pink moth. We'll have to figure out what that moth. is. Yeah, I'm going to have to type that. And um, I put took some pictures, so hopefully a couple of them turned out. And I also want to figure out what that wildflower is that it was on yeah. because it's starting to bloom. It's got um, yellow blossoms on it. So. Yeah. And what about the, um, Luke, you saw the wasp nest, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that'll take us into homestead chores if you guys want to talk about the yellow jacket Yeah, nest. sure, yeah. yeah. Anybody want to give their overall impressions before we start talking about our yeah, it's, methods it, of eradication? It's immortal. It <laughs> it's it's the, uh, the wasp nest that won't die. Yeah. So we it's figure, disease. or I said, I, I should say I figured, the first few times Will got stung, I was like, well, you know, he's kind of marked for death because he's working with the bees and he displaced <laughs> the hornets that were living in the, the old front yeah, patio yeah. when you replaced that. So I was like, you know. But once I got stung... That, to me, was an all-out declaration of war, right? It's all fun and games to go after the man of the house, but once you start going after women and children, you have openly declared war. Yeah. So we did a bit of research because, obviously, with the homestead apiary up the hill, we didn't want to use any chemical insecticides. It turns out that one of the professional methods for yellow jacket nest removal involves uh, a shop vacuum. So a couple of nights ago, we got our shop back all set up. We connected all of the attachments to the hose to make it as long as possible and positioned it right at the entrance of their nest. And then not quite as early as we intended the next morning, but as early as we could the next morning, we turned that shop back on and we sucked the yellow jackets as they were coming and going foraging uh, from the nest. We let that run, I should say, I let that run for about five hours before I saw a drop off in activity. And then I uh, removed, the, you know, turned the shop back off, removed the hose from the entrance of the nest, inverted it into a flower pot filled with sand, and then tied that up in a plastic trash bag. So that bag. they couldn't fly out exactly. of the tunnel. So that they right. couldn't fly out you, of the hose. You haven't seen the shop vac full of no, wasps yeah, you yet. said you were going to show me. Yeah, we're going to yeah. show you that. We'll have to yeah. show you that. So we thought we had done a pretty good job yeah. sucking out the wasp nest, <laughs> and then we're monitoring out, monitoring that for the next couple of days and notice there are still foragers coming and going from the nest. Activity has significantly dropped off, but there was still activity going on, which is more than you want to see with a yellow jacket nest at the corner of your deck. Yeah, what's up, Luke? I was thinking it was either Will or Sarah said that I think we should flood them out. That might take away yeah you can flood the foragers and also if they have any eggs you can hopefully flood them out so then there's no you mean like feet. run the hose down yeah there? yeah i'm nervous because i'm like man what if they're i don't i don't like what can they swim i have no idea i, I don't know anything hold about their that. little wasp breath <laughs> yeah yeah well we can mention some other things we've tried based on our extensive internet and research failed to fail to eradicate it yeah them. one was white vinegar uh which is supposed to work <laughs> one was uh dr bronner's magic castile mint soap 
uh, diluted in a little bit of water. Multiple kettles of boiling water. Actually, I was going to add on that. But then again, if you do fill it with water, you don't know how deep it is, so that may cause a sinkhole. That could cause oh, a sinkhole, geez. yeah. Hopefully the next one's <laughs> that's right over the deck, so. but, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, um, that's one unfortunate invasive species that we are at war with currently on the property are, is the yellow jackets who are nesting at the corner of our deck. I think that, you know, their hive community is population is is compromised you know i think they're struggling and I, we're hoping that they'll abandon that nesting site yeah. but so far any yellow jacket is too many yellow jackets um because their sting is brutal yeah it goes strange. from a terrible burning pain that makes you want to amputate your limb <laughs> to a terrible burning itch that still makes you want to amputate your limb i, I got it stung tuesday and it's sunday and it still itches and Sarah got stung like Thursday, yeah Thursday, and um, you're still itching. Yeah, so. yeah. I don't want a future sting in the head. Exactly. Well. Last time Luke was hanging out with us, he got stung in the head when we were trying to cut a new path through the woods. So we were trying to prevent that this year. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> right got now, my raccoon hat. Really got protection. Oh yeah, we're gonna be asking you about that in a minute. Um, the other thing that I'm planning to go to war with this week is our stilt grass. This is an invasive species of grass from, I believe I read, Japan. Mm. Um, it first came to the United States, as far as folks can track it, uh, in Tennessee in the 19-teens, I believe. Uh -huh. And it's thought that the grass was used as packing material for imports of pottery. And that there were some seeds in the packing material and that they obviously got out, um, colonized parts of Tennessee and have since spread up the East Coast from there. We've got it wow. coming down the slope down the grade from the game lands and the private trust into our backyard and it's clearly spread from when we came here you know 18 months ago to now um, as far as removal methods if you don't want to use herbicide which we don't uh, it, you're talking about hand pulling so right now what I'm working on is basically waiting for a nice set of rainy days so that that will loosen up the soil, loosen up the roots in the soil, and it'll be that much easier and more effective to hand pull. Uh, word to the wise, if you've got weeding to do, either wait for a period of rain or water the area yourself, although to me that's kind of a waste of water if you can just wait for some rain. I wonder um, if you can do the, um, the way you do the devil's spaghetti or uh, the mile a minute vine, which is where you take um, like a a pitchfork and spin it in the root system, maybe that would help rip it out. Maybe, but it's interceded with um, some other plants that I don't want to tear out that yeah. I haven't actually identified, but a lot of them are flowering. So they're, they might be important to our pollinators and the honeybees, given nice that we're seed. moving into the fall season. Spreads um, my seed. So, so yeah. Currently on the homestead, in terms of chores, we're basically going to war with the stilt grass, the invasive stilt grass, and the yellow jackets. Another thing that we're trying to manage is uh, we've got three butterfly bushes on the property, mm -hmm. and we need to be deadheading those to, because that's again considered an invasive species. It's an aggressive self-seeder. So by deadheading the flowers after they've bloomed and... Um, you know, once they're no longer ripe producing nectar for pollinators, you can just clip them off and then they won't produce seeds and spread beyond control. So controlling stiltgrass, the butterfly bush, and the yellow jacket nest is what we're working on this week. Um, Luke has abandoned us at the recorder, so we'll wait for him to come back to ask him about his uh, fashionable headwear. I was reading about the stiltgrass on the invasives. Invasive. Uh, oh yeah, he found our DCNR um, yes. list of invasive plant species. Do you want to give folks an, any other information about the stilt grass? Does it say you said it's spread by seed? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So it so. is an annual, so it can only spread by seed. But uh, mm -hmm. it's so just quite aggressive. Try to, yeah, it's if you ever very try aggressive. to take it out, maybe dig a hole under it, so then you don't, so none of the seeds fall. Yeah. yeah, or try to get it before it seeds. Now is actually a great time because it's taller than the other plants that it's growing in. So it's easy to grab it at the top as opposed to what Will was suggesting, which is um, twining it around a pitchfork. I just worried that you would pull out everything else with it, which is yeah. you don't want to do. Um, but again, we've had a little bit of a dry spell out here in uh, Warwick, Pennsylvania, where Satyam is located. So... Um, you know, the ground's a little harder, the roots are a little more matted, and um, a little more um, 
aggressive about sticking in the ground, so you just want to wait for a wet period where the soil's loosened up and the roots are loosened up and you can easily pull stuff out. So while you're here, Luke, we'll ask you about your fashionable headwear. We wouldn't, you know, we'll ask you to model it for us, but the folks listening won't be able to see. But do you want to tell us the story of your hat? Just think of a person with a raccoon hat on. There you go. <laughs> it's a raccoon hat. How did you come by this raccoon hat? Well, you guys gave it to me. Who found it? Sarah found it. Yeah, Sarah yeah. found the raccoon on the road and brought it home, I think. Yeah, and brought it home and they, did you dry it out? Yeah, I have yeah. no idea the procedure that you took. Yeah, yeah, you skin the animal. Skinned it, dried it. Dry it out. And then, um, yeah, then you have to cut it into pieces to um, to get it into a hat shape. Mm -hmm. But you have to match the pieces together. Um, I don't know, you have to match the pieces together so that it, it's all with the same grain. So it looks like natural. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, you, like, different parts are brown. Like, if you look at the tail... The tail of the raccoon was brown, and so is the front. The neck of the raccoon is brown. So, like, you have to match up the colors. It's got some gray in it. It must have been old. Yeah. <laughs> it was a big raccoon. I mean, that whole hat is from one. And I was reading on the internet that you could use as many as two or three raccoons to make one hat. So, it must have been a pretty decently sized... Well, it was a decently sized male raccoon, I would say. Um... And just to clarify a couple of things, it was roadkill. Road so this was an honorable way to um, utilize the animal. It was free, which is good. <laughs> it's good. Free is better, right? Um, so yeah, I spotted it better. on the way to work. And Will and I had actually been scouting out for a nice roadkill raccoon for this project specifically. So we both had roadkill recovery kits in our cars, which basically consists of plastic bags and rubber gloves. <laughs> So I called him and I said, oh, there's this great roadkill raccoon on, you know, on our street. Do you have your roadkill recovery kit? Because if not, I'll pick it up now and bring it back to the house. Yeah. But he was prepared. So he picked it up and brought it back to the house. And then later that day, exactly as you said, you skinned it from the carcass. Mm -hmm. We left the carcass out for the buzzards, which I'm sure they appreciated. And then it's not quite a drying out process. It's a tanning process, which involves yeah. liquid. Yeah. So do you want to talk more about that? Um, so what you do is you salt it. So you put a lot of salt on it right as soon as you get the, t the hide off the animal. You want to salt it down as much as you can um, while you prepare the pickle because you basically pickle it. And you pickle it with um, aluminum sulfide. I think it's, it's alum is usually what's called A-L-U-M. And so you pickle it together in a, in a um, for like one cup of that, one cup of salt in a couple gallons of water. It doesn't have to be precise. The idea is to have it have a real good salty solution for when you throw the hide in there and then a couple of weeks later you could be it can be a week later you'll um you'll pull it out flesh it which means you have to take the fat off and that can be really difficult you have to use the a big knife and and try to get the flesh off and describe the knife that you use now because you started off with basically a pocket knife and it that wasn't work. Going so yeah well. so i went on ebay i ordered a um just a used old draw knife which is a knife with two handles and you pull it towards you. Mm. And so the sharp side is towards you and you pull it down. So you, I tack up the hide to something. Like I have this pole that's out. It's like an old telephone pole out in the backyard that some, they, uh, the previous owners had left. I nail up the hide and then I pull down and that pulls the fat off. Because if the fat's on there, it'll start to stink really bad. Mm, it's gotcha. um, yeah, right? Because it's, it's actually flesh of the animal that will be st that, that will uh, rot and yeah. smell. Um does it smell at all, Luke? He's taking a whiff. <laughs> a deep whiff. <laughs> a deep whiff. <laughs> Doesn't really have a smell. It actually smells like some kind of camping, like... Huh. Fire? Smoke? Yeah, it's kind of like that, but not really strong. Because one of the last steps, once it's, uh, once you throw it back it in the like pickle... smells like a garage. Huh. Well, once you throw it back in the pickle... And you just let it sit there for a little bit longer. And you stir it every once in a while. Make sure there's no air bubbles. Because air bubbles will make it rot too. Before it's pickled. Um, you shampoo it. <sighs> so I, I really, I literally put like, we had some shampoo from a hotel or something. I put some of that in there. Just some cheap shampoo. And uh, and shampooed it. Yeah. And so it smelled, it smelled fabulous for like 
fabulous. For like a week or something. It actually smells like shampoo now that I think. Ah, the power of suggestion. Yes. So it smells. It smelled much better because before that, it's got like fat on the hair. I mean, like, it's been sitting on the side of the road for who knows how long. Yeah, well, I think it was only overnight because yeah. I, didn't, I didn't see that raccoon the night before. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking. It probably got hit during the early morning commute. Yeah. That's my guess. Yeah, hit by a bus or something. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so anyway, that's how they make a coonskin hat. So. And we recently learned a term for this whole return to use, you know, to honoring the entire animal and using all the parts is apparently called vulture culture. So we are all vulture participants culture. in the vulture culture. I did not know. We've that. got a couple of friends and other family members who are interested in um, recovering, you know, bones when they walk through the woods. If they see bones, skeletal components, yeah. old Actually, butterfly yeah. wings, moth wings, uh, chicken feathers. Uh, that's my contribution. Uh, yeah. You can do a lot of cool arts and crafts related stuff with that. Costume making, obviously making raccoon skin hats. I'm still waiting for my rabbit gloves. No, just kidding. <laughs> but yeah. But, uh, yeah, vulture culture, there you go, we're up with the times. Yeah. Speaking of being up with the times, unless there are any other homestead updates, we'll move into the ag news. At my house, homestead, I don't know what it's called. Is sure, it? yeah, you got a homestead. <laughs> a while ago, my dad and I were in the river, in a river, um, and he found a jaw of either a uh. dog or some kind of wild animal in the river. And I kept it because I'm just weird like that. Nah, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Your vulture culture. Yeah, I should have brought it. It's yeah. really cool looking. When you've been out on your hunting trips and anything, have you ever found like deer antlers? We found deer innards. innards? Deer innards. Yeah. Uh, really another gross. successful hunter, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Even though it's kind of gross. <laughs> yeah. Because I heard like people can make really good money going out, like if they grab deer antlers that are shed. Yeah, they yeah. shed them every year. I actually have yeah. deer antlers at my house also. Yeah. Because yeah. then you can use those the next year. If you're hunting deer, you can... Yeah, you, that's to make it together. sound like two bucks are fighting. Yeah. So then another buck may come. Yeah. While we're talking about making animal noises, would you care to... <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> entertain our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> actually, nice. earlier this morning, <laughs> I was talking to a dove... I have no idea what he was saying. He was probably saying, you're crazy. <laughs> yep. You got a call and response going with the morning doves. So that's, <laughs> that's very cool. That's Good awesome. talent to have. All right. Great. So I think that's going to take us into our ag news updates for the week. Uh, we forgot to mention today is Sunday, August 2nd. Yes. So we're going to be reading out of the Saturday, August 1st edition of Lancaster Farming. So let me flip to our first feature article here. We'll be in A section. I'm flipping back to page A10. And our first headline here is Small Meat Markets on the Rise in Michigan. The author is Rachel Greco, and this is from the Lansing State Journal, provided by the Associated Press. So this is out of Lansing, Michigan. And the first person we're going to be talking about is Greg Saltzman who had a, quote, 29-year career spent cutting meat for Felposh supermarkets, and he's now joined a growing number of entrepreneurs who say a demand for small meat markets has grown small in Michigan. Number. In the last four years, several have opened in and around Lansing. And there's another proprietor named Shirley Decker who says that knowledge is part of a meat market's appeal. So she also, her and her family own a meat market. And she's quoted as saying, after we opened, we had people say, aren't you scared? You opened during a recession. Never once was I scared. This community will support us because we do it right. Further down in the article, it says the research showed that local meat sourcing was named the number one culinary trend for 2014 and that customers or consumers are actually willing to pay more for local meat. So part of the appeal, I think, is having a, a community, like a place in your community that you can go talk to people who know things about the product that they're selling. In this article, they discuss the fact that they'll give their customers advice on how to prepare different meats. And we've actually talked this week about how we're going to put some ground venison on the menu, right? Our neighbors mm. up the street were very kind to give us some of their surplus frozen venison, ground venison. And we had prepared it as tacos Taco. a couple of weeks ago. So we're going to do a taco, taco, taco sampler taco, this week with taco, um, taco. some fresh beef from taco, a local taco, farm. Taco, taco. Why not farm? <laughs> some fresh venison from just up the street and also some uh, fresh organic chicken. So that'll be great. 
Um, and I also think, as we've discussed previously on the podcast, there is in general a return to uh, small scale local agriculture, and in this case, you know, animal husbandry and meat, meat preparation, mm. butchering, and, and seasoning and <sighs> preservation. So I think that it's a more sustainable way to produce and consume foods. Um, Again, you're less susceptible to shocks in the market, as we've seen this year, unfortunately, with avian flu and its impact on egg production. Not so much um, chicken meat production, because there were um, export controls put in place. So since other countries weren't importing chicken meat from the United States due to avian flu, we actually had a surplus of meat hmm. on our market. Um, but it did obviously impact the market for eggs. So I think when you have local production and you have local a local client base, a community of customers who are willing to pay just a little bit more to have um, produce or meat that's of higher quality, that's been um, obtained and prepared and raised in an ethical way, um, where the animals are, are care, cared for and attention is paid to their health and well-being, um, people are you know willing to pay a little more. So where are we? So you asked me last, yeah, I, I think it was yesterday to go by. The market and pick up some some locally sourced meat right mm -hmm. um so you and luke you might have seen on your on your way let's see on your way up here before the uh, why not farm out there on route 401 where they have the longhorns the big uh, shaggy longhorns have you seen that farm no. Was it coming up here after Allentown? No. no. I was gonna say I was it would gonna have been the asleep. last time you were up here. You were asleep, yeah. <laughs> but um, we we buy our our hamburger meat and our hot dogs, and hopefully soon bacon and and other things oh, from. I want bacon. From, they carry uh, chicken as well, as well chicken. as local cheeses. And you saw the uh, beef stick. They do like jerky. beef jerky. The sticks. hot beef stick. Hot yeah, beef I want to try that. Yeah, we can definitely try that this weekend. Definitely. Yeah. And that's something that you know, Will, you and I have noticed since raising the chickens is you realize that. Sure, they're not the smartest creatures on, <laughs> on the earth. However, they do have personalities, and you can tell when they're content and when they're happy and when they're yeah. healthy. And you can also tell when they're not content and not healthy and not happy. That's definitely and true. And I think just having that relationship of, you know, animal husbander to animal or producer to, to product has made us realize that it's worth that little bit extra. It's worth a little bit extra in, in planning your travel time. You know, luckily we've got a number of farms on our commutes that we can stop at, and it's yeah. worth paying that little bit extra to have the peace of mind to know that that animal was respected in its life, was was harvested respectfully and at the right time, and that you're supporting a local producer who's going to stay in business and feed their family because you spend a couple of extra bucks at their farm. Yeah. So it's definitely a trend that we've seen in ourselves. It's interesting, you know, being closer to meat production hasn't turned us into vegetarians, but it has <laughs> turned us into more uh, conscientious meat consumers in that we, you know, we're, we have a growing interest in wild game. Which is obviously oh, yes. can be very local. Yeah, yeah you like we'll be that. trying the venison this week, and we have a growing interest in in locally and ethically produced um, agricultural meat. Yeah, so, kind of interesting. All right, so that was that article. Flipping a little further in the Saturday, August first edition of Lancaster Farming, we're in section A on page A thirteen. We want to give a shout out for Pennsylvania designating August as Agritourism Month. Hey. So this is an article written by Russell Redding. He's Pennsylvania's Secretary of Agriculture. And again, the headline is August designated as Agritourism Month. So we'll let you check out this article. We'll be linking to it online in the show notes when we get those posted to spreadcast.tumblr.com. But I just wanted to quote a few lines from the article under his seg section called Agritourism Opportunities. Russell Redding says... I invite everyone to learn more about what agritourism has to offer. Stop by visitpa.com and check out Keystone Country, a collection of road trips and maps to help you plan your agritourism destinations on your travel route. Represent. Yeah, represent. He also goes on to say, quote, when you buy local, you are supporting your community's economy and you know not only where that produce came from, but also who grew it. And just as a reminder to folks, we kind of touched on this a little bit ago when we mentioned avian flu in Pennsylvania, but Russell Redding says one in seven Pennsylvania jobs is related to agriculture. Wow. So that's really a lot. You're talking about more than 10% of the mm -hmm. working folks in Pennsylvania 
have their livelihood tied up in agriculture. Mm -hmm. So if you can, you know, spend those hard on earned dollars on what they call PA preferred agriculture, which is any agricultural product that was produced uh, or processed in the state, yes. then you know exactly where your money's going. So um, definitely check out those maps. It's visitpa.com and look for Keystone Country and you'll get all kinds of ideas about agritourism. Um, he mentions some of the the industries, which I'll just kind of sum up here. There's a number of festivals going on. We've got arboretums, which are basically tree parks, botanical gardens, historic barns, corn mazes, a lot of pick-your-own farm locations, and he also reminds you, uh, Pennsylvania's got a number of local vineyards and vineyards, so if um, you're interested in the wine industry, you can find that on Pennsylvania as well. So that was from Russell Redding, our State Secretary of Agriculture. We're going to flip just a little deeper into Section A here. So this is another Pennsylvania-specific article on avian flu planning. This is on page A21 of the Saturday, August 1st edition of Lancaster Farming. And the headline is, Pennsylvania provides update on avian flu planning. So a couple of episodes ago, we talked about how much money they were earmarking for yeah. emergency preparedness measures. As of now, again, it's, you know, August 2nd, Sunday, August 2nd. We still do not have a confirmed case of avian flu in the state. But we do think that they're, um, they're preparing, you know, as, as well as you could, as far as we know. So, again, they mentioned that $3.5 million that's been earmarked for um, emergency response. And they talk about some of the impacts in the rest of the country, especially the Midwest, where the avian flu has already hit. And then they've got a series of bullet points here about the measures they've already taken. So I'll just summarize those quickly. Um, they've, quote, convened a high path avian influenza task force with industry and academia to collaborate on all aspects of response and recovery planning. Quote, held multiple briefings with the governor, cabinet members and legislators to discuss the situation and steps that will need to be taken should the virus be found here. They've conducted numerous tabletop exercises to practice various scenarios and familiarize the department staff and industry stakeholders with response and recovery activities in the event of an outbreak. Further on, they've, quote, established response protocols with USDA APHIS and discussed biosecurity measures for responders and the industry, as well as protocols for federal indemnification, the depopulation and disposal of dead birds, and how to manage the movement of poultry and poultry products into, within, and out of quarantine zones. Um, they've suspended all avian shows at county fairs for 2015 and at the 2016 Pennsylvania Farm Show, which I believe is in January. I actually want to mention, we're not going to read it, but there is a cover article on this week's edition of Lancaster Farming called Thinking Outside the Cage, about all of the creative ways that the different ag fairs are still displaying um, poultry, mm. using photographs, using live video feeds. Um, and allowing fairgoers to still kind of enjoy the poultry competitions and, and watching the egg laying and all of that and the egg hatching, um, just not in a <laughs> live, real-time capacity, obviously due to concern about the spread of avian influenza. And finally, quote, they've issued an interstate quarantine order requiring all poultry moving to live bird markets and flocks producing eggs destined for commercial breaking operations in Pennsylvania to meet a 72-hour testing requirement. So Luke, Luke was... Signaling me, he wants to know more about. It. He he doesn't know about the avian flu, at all. Does that have to do with so. birds? Yes. Also. So I don't know if you notice. I don't know how often, Luke, you get to go to the grocery store. Um, but really, since I guess the beginning of the year, you've seen signs apologizing for egg shortages. Signs yeah. apologizing. I heard for my mom talking about like there's a exactly. lot of less eggs. Price increases in eggs. That's due to the fact that there was an avian influenza outbreak. It either started late last fall or, or in the winter out in the Midwest where mm -hmm. we have where a lot of the large commercial laying flocks are located. And, and influenza being like the flu right. for birds. So Is you're that... talking about them like getting fevers. Yeah, you know, when you get the flu. You Runny get nose and sneezing and, and loose droppings um, are some of the major symptoms. And then and then death in like 24 hours. Like, yeah. it's really bad. It's yeah. a really bad and disease. And it spreads very easily. Yeah. They've um, got bird doctors. Yeah, we, yeah. Need, we need vets on the scene. Yeah. So, you know, again, we're not experts on avian influenza by any means, but... Yeah. As a non-expert, it certainly seems like the state of Pennsylvania and our agricultural department are taking all reasonable measures to protect the state and our poultry producers from the spread of the disease. And um, 
We read, okay, here it is. Yeah, I was going to say, we read a couple of weeks ago about the total dollar value of the poultry industry in the state. It's $13 billion dollars just in Pennsylvania. That's a lot of birds. Is the value of the poultry industry, <laughs> and it represents a number of jobs, um, which again, we quoted on a previous episode of the podcast. Yeah. So you can check that out there. So, you know, we want to obviously thank uh, the state government, the legislator, the governor for making that funding available to make sure that there is a uh, coordination and people involved to um, respond, you know, immediately should uh, an outbreak be confirmed in the state. Um, and in the meantime, it's really good to see that there's cooperation between um, researchers and producers and the government in making sure that, um, you know, that our flocks are protected because it's it's not just the livelihoods of all those people involved in the industry. It's also about our access to the eggs and the meat. Yeah. So keep up the good work there. No protein. No exactly. eggs, no protein. Yeah. So, I mean, we actually were, we talked in other podcasts, Luke, about how um, the backyard chickens mm -hmm. is not as much of a problem because um, because the uh, backyard chickens are um, protected because they're not in big groups of chickens. You know, when you have like, have you ever seen one of the huge yeah. houses of chickens? It's like thousands and rows and thousands of chickens. And hey! Bless, bless you. you. Thank you. Do you have um, avian flu? Yep. <laughs> there's, so there's, there's a real problem with having chickens in those big houses like that but we don't have that problem because they're out here you've seen them they can kind of run yeah. around Into but the um, it's also wild birds and stuff that in particular no waterfowl your ducks your geese ducks and they're geese. they're responsible for a lot of the spread how does it how does it spread <laughs> i think mm -hmm. it's the same way that you know human spread flu i believe that it's uh droplets carrying um, the virus so when they sneeze when yeah. they you know have diarrhea so like air exactly it's um, sort of an airborne so uh, droplet if you have avian flu you just sneezed all over us so yeah now we have it now we, a lot. Have, <laughs> we have avian flu is it gonna go through the recorder yeah go through the recorder right to our listeners yep it's a dangerous dangerous podcast right have here. fun <laughs> um so i added a little article here uh towards the end on a28 ear tags used to detect disease in beef cattle so if you have a cattle operation you're obviously going to have to deal with cow disease and diseased cows right so hopefully not mad cows yeah i was just about to say <laughs> <laughs> so um they actually have created um accelerometers which are small electro mechanical devices that measure acceleration um so in, in your smartphone you know how um you can shake it and it'll do certain things or like... Or track your steps. Track your yeah. steps. Yeah, to track your steps. Exactly. So um, they've created them for cows and they put them on their ear and they detect the sensitive motions from the number of steps taken, right, um, to jaw movements. Um, and they use these to detect um, feed intake, heat, and uh, sick animals. And um, this one called Sensor Cow Manager. <laughs> Shout out. You, Shout out, <laughs> unsolicited shout out to Sensor Cow Manager. Uses a proprietary algorithm to quantify ear movements. So it actually can measure how many times a day the um, it's, it's using its ears, as well as time spent feeding, ruminating, resting, and being active. And so they all upload this to a program, and then you can see how your whole um, herd of cows is doing. So I guess there's a number of, like healthy ear movements per day that a cow would have. Yeah, definitely. If you watch a herd of cows, they're always flicking their ears to get flies off and that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. So the picture, you guys can see it here. Um, and we'll link to this online as well. Yeah, it's just a, uh, it's a calf with, with, the, uh, with the ear monitor on it. But Wait, yeah, I mean, it's, it's fairly unobtrusive. It's not, in a, it's got to be a great way to measure like cow's health. Aid. It does look like a hearing aid, right? It goes, goes over mm -hmm. the goes over the ear. Well, and that's part of a broader things. precision agriculture movement where you see the integration of real-time technologies and agricultural practice, whether it's tracking soil health and the need for fertilizers and, and making sure that you're getting the fertilizers in at the right time and in the right place and in the right amount to minimize runoff, whether it's tracking the health of your cows, whether it's tracking the movement of bees, which we talked about yes. a couple of weeks ago. Um, so, so it's they've, they've or drone used to monitor crop health, that kind of thing. They've used, um, they have little sensors on bees to track where the bees are going. 
we'll like put them on a thousand bees and send them out to to see where they're going and what. Well, some of them were infected with nosema, and then there was a control group. So it was to track the behavioral differences between the nosema infected bees and the healthy bees. Yep, and like GPS for tractors, Mm -hmm. like to help them, um, you know, make straight rows across the uh, across the entire field because some of those fields are miles long and things like that. So. Yeah, there's all kinds of cool technology. So anyway, I thought this this ear tag one was cool because I, I would have never really thought that the ear flapping of the cow could be a sign of the health, but it makes complete sense when you think about it. Mm-hmm. So And we should say algorithms, too. It mentioned um, analyzing those according to an algorithm. That's just a, a mathematical model yeah. of data points over time, so right? 500 ear flaps per hour is good for a cow. Or, or so like many that. ear flaps within a certain period of time. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So that's pretty cool. So you see, again, the coming together of, of research and technology and agriculture. Yeah. We have one more feature article this week, and this actually comes from a local paper. comes out of the Tri-County Record, the Tuesday, July 28th edition. Um, the headline is, Sunflowers Bloom at Car Wash in Elverson. This was written by Lisa Mitchell, who is with the Tri-County Record. So quoting from the article... Blooming sunflowers are attracting flower and nature enthusiasts to a car wash in Elverson. Um, And the person that planted them's name is Rick Frey. He's the owner of Please Wash Me Car Wash at 1 Yinks Drive in Elverson. He says, my sunflowers that I plant an acre every year are opening. It's something that I donate to the community. And Mr. Frey has planted an acre of sunflowers every year for the past seven years. And he encourages uh, members of the public to come see the flowers, cut them, take pictures, and it's all free of charge. Wow. So this is an unsolicited endorsement, actually, you know, from folks that never wash our cars, unfortunately. But (laughs) please wash me car wash in Elverson. Owner Rick Frey, thank you very much for this public service, not just to the humans in the community, but also to the pollinators, the goldfinches, the squirrels, everybody that's going to enjoy all of those sunflowers. Yeah, they will seeds. enjoy them. Too. Cheap yeah. is good, free is better. Cheap yeah. is good, free is better. So nice work there, Mr. Frey, of an acre of uh, free sunflowers for the public. So, Luke, what do you um, want to see while you're here on, on the homestead here? Is there anything you haven't seen yet that you want to see? Not to put you on the spot. Um, but to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've seen everything. <laughs> Have you? You've got a, you've got a good survey. We if you we haven't done a fire up at the fire pit, right? Yeah, we have. We Last time I came here. We did do that, so we're gonna try to cook some cook hot some dogs. Hot dogs. Why not farm hot dogs? Why Unsolicited farms. endorsement. <laughs> yes. And um and yeah, go by to nearby French Creek and maybe do some Falling down. Falling, falling down, down to the lake. Or paddle boarding. Or paddle boarding, depending on how skilled you are, which I'm not skilled at all. And yeah. Luke and I will have the advantage with our lower centers of gravity. Yeah, I think so. I may have trouble. For once, tall is bad. <laughs> tall yeah. is bad. Yeah. Tall is not an advantage. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Original Transplant signing off, episode five. Thanks. Look for us online at spreadcast.tumblr.com where you'll be able to find a transcript with show notes and references. And if you want to learn more about Satayama Homestead, we're located in Satayama. Warwick, Chester County, Pennsylvania. You can find us at satayamahs.org. Yes, thank you. Thanks for listening. Peace Thanks for out. Joining us. <laughs>